Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe so we can get you these messages every single week. Have a great day. Hallelujah. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. Isn't God good? Just take it in, y'all. Just take it in. That's the most peace that some of you have had all week long. Such a funny dynamic in church that sometimes there are, there are those folks that are there that just can't wait for it to get over. You know, just, you know, can we just move it along? You know, we sang that song three times already. What are we doing? But then there are others that are in that same atmosphere that are like, could y'all just five or six more days, let's just go ahead and, and just enjoy the presence of God here this morning. I, 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 one of the things that I've, that I'm learning as I get a little bit older is that it's, it's good to sit and soak and, and take it in. I think we're a culture that is conditioned to speed and to be in a hurry and let's just, you know, let's just get it moving. And sometimes when we get into those moments of waiting, we, we get uncomfortable with that and people start, you know, wondering, let's just wait on the Lord and just let God say something, do something, speak into your life. Let him, because somebody in here needs healing. And if you need healing, you're not in a hurry. You're like, let's just let God do something in my life. Somebody, God is restoring some things in you. It's a beautiful thing. We welcome you this morning and, and glad you're in the house. I don't know uh, if anybody is visiting with us this morning, but if you are, we're glad that you're here. We're welcoming you today. I pray that you've already had a blessing, and if you have not, that it's coming your way in, in a moment. I normally don't look for particular persons, but is Kathy Murray in the room this morning? You said you were coming from North Carolina. Are you here, in here? She might be, no, online. <laughs> That's why I don't mention people. Because <laughs> right now she's watching online going, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you have your Bible open with the first Samuel. We, uh, once again, tomorrow night at 6.30 is the class on the Holy Spirit. Paul, Wal- or Paul Pearson is going to be teaching that, not Paul Walker. Oof. Today is Communion Sunday, and so if you are staying with us, stay for the entire time. I would also encourage you if, you, if it matters to you and you care, to stay with us the entire time, all the way to the end today, because I'm going to conclude today with some, an update on uh, the purchase of the land that we have been working on to try to get all that done and taken care of, and I want to share that with our house and share that with you all and see what God is doing at the moment. And 1 Samuel, are you there yet? 1 Samuel chapter 30. Not long ago, I was in a conversation with someone, and somewhere along the way of, of that conversation, they had a breakdown uh, that, was kind of, that was expected and unexpected both at the same time. It was a little, bit of a, a little bit of a moment. I love those moments when people are comfortable enough with you to just take off the mask and just let it go, and you know, you know what I mean? Just to be who they are in that moment. Uh, knowing them like I do, it was expected and unexpected because I, I had known some of the challenges that they were, had been walking through. And in their life, maybe sometimes like yours, it was one thing after another. It was like that old adage, when the enemy comes in like a flood. In their life, that is how it was happening. This one thing after another, and, and eventually it just got to the point where it just wore through, and, and, and it was unexpected to me also at the same time because um, from the outside looking in, it never looked to me like any of those things had an effect on them. And I think we all can understand that. We all know people like that. We all know people who are like that in life that all hell can be raining down on them. Their life can be going to pieces. They can feel so much brokenness and heartache in their lives at that moment. But when you say, hey, how are you doing? Their immediate response is to say, I'm good. I'm great. Everything's fine. Where where are all my I'm fine people at? Y'all need prayer before we finish out of here this morning. I'm talking to you, Kelsey. Those I'm fine people, those I'm fine people. How is everything? I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, sometimes, can I get a witness? You're not fine. Sometimes you're everything but fine. And saying that you're fine is not a positive confession. It's, it's, it's you lying. You're just lying. And so on this day, um, in this conversation with them, everything that had been bottled up inside of them just finally bubbled to the top. You want to know how I'm feeling? 
I'm sick of everything. I'm tired of it. My, my whole life, it feels like my whole life is falling into a thousand pieces. Nothing is working. My friends, my family, my future, my money, my peace, the stability that I thought I had, the plans that I had laid out for my life. I thought my life was going to be like this, and now it's not at all like that. And it just, yeah, just all. That conversation that day became this word based on this moment in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And if you would, in honor of the word today, would you stand with me, please, as we read the word of God? It's First Samuel chapter 30, starting in verse 1. Now it happened, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great, Listen, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept, watch this, until they had no more power to weep. These were mighty men. These were not your beta males. These were mighty men. And David's two wives, verse 5, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Mm. There's a turnaround happening here, y'all. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying... Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake him? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Mm. It's going to be a good day in the house this morning. This morning I want to talk with you about, listen to this, the importance of pressure. Now, largely, this is mostly going to be a hypothetical sermon this morning because probably most of you in here have no idea what pressure is. You're, you're God's favorite child. Your life is great. Your bills are paid. Your family gets along. You have great a workplace. I understand. So if y'all will just this morning humor me, I, I'm just going to try to dredge up some, some thoughts that maybe someone somewhere will experience what I'm talking about, the importance and the power of pressure. As a part of this, we're going to look at the meanings of several prominent words that were in this story. The Philistines, Ziklag, the king Achish. We're going to look at the meanings of their names because their names really tell the story. Your Bible is the Word of God. Your Bible is spirit and it is life. And it is living and alive even right now in this moment. It is alive. And the word of this word is going to come into your life and change the situation for you. Father, today your kingdom come, your will be done. Let your word be heard. Let a word from heaven change the direction of our lives. And we thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. You may be seated, please. Thank you for honoring the word. I've told you many times over the years that of all of the characters that we are introduced to in the Bible... And if by chance you're ever asked, however many there are, there are 3,437 characters that are mentioned in the Bible. Of all of the characters that are mentioned in the Bible, my personal favorite, obviously aside from Jesus, is David. Overlooked, undervalued, disregarded, disrespected, shepherd, psalmist, warrior, king, dangerous man. Dangerous man. Some people think that, wrongly think that David was a peaceful man with a capacity for violence. Nothing could be further from the truth. David was a violent man with a capacity, a certain capacity for peace in his life. 
When it came time to build the temple, you remember that it was God who twice said in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, you are a man of blood. His own enemy, 2 Samuel chapter 16, Shimei called him a bloody man. You are a bloody man. When it comes to David, I mean, when, when, when you read his story, he, when he kills Goliath, one of the most iconic moments in that is when he cuts off the giant's head with his own sword, and he holds it on display. For all of the people to see that, you have to testify and say, that is a bad man. That is a bad man. Obviously passionate about God. But many times... You wonder as you speak with him because he is so flawed that you wonder if you're not dealing with somebody who has a very severe personality disorder. <laughs> Honestly, I told you he's my favorite character. I relate perfectly to this. On the one hand, he's writing these amazing, these amazing songs. I mean, he almost is like this poet, poet out writing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm not making fun of you, David. <laughs> But, he, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. He writes these most beautiful things. But in the very next breath, he's, he's the same guy that writes Psalms 3. Lord, shatter their teeth. Amen. These punks have been all over me for so long. God, knock their teeth out. And in and, and Psalms 109, I mean, he sounds like Al Capone. Read Psalms 109. Let his children be fatherless and their wives be a widow. David is saying, kill them all. That's my favorite character. <laughs> I love that guy. This story is one of my favorite moments in his life. I've, I've, I have devoured, I have devoured his life. This is one of my favorite because it's filled with teachable moments. As, as I see this, because stuff starts happening and then it keeps happening. Sometimes you have those times in your life when I'm using the word stuff, but you know, stuff happens. And then it just keeps happening. And then there's a something else that happens on top of that stuff. And the next thing you know, it's just all of it is, is over everywhere. David is on the run from King Saul, as he has been for years. Since the day that he killed Goliath and they came walking back into the city and the women sang the song, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. David has lived that, his life every day with a target on his back. Every day of his life, Saul was jealous. And in this moment, after years of running from King Saul, he gets, finally he gets so tired of it, listen, that without consulting God for direction. And that is critical for you to be able to understand everything in this story that follows. I'll say that one more time. That in this moment, without consulting God for direction, without seeking God, he defects from his own people and he defects to his enemies. And he immerses himself in the culture of the Philistine people. It's a strange moment in his life. It lasted for about 18 months. He immersed himself in the culture of the Philistines. He left his own people behind and went to set up camp with his enemies. Let me remind you of a very precipitous thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 says, never forget this, bad corrupt company corrupts good character. I don't have time to preach this, but the names on your friends list always matter. Mm, I don't have time to preach that. But there are some names that when they appear on your caller ID and they say, hey, can we go out tonight? Your immediate response is no. No. No, we, we cannot because I'm not going there. I came from there. I'm not going back to there. He runs to the Philistines, whose name, literally translated, means grievers, weakeners, to wear down. You have to remember that that is in, incumbent in their nature. It is incumbent in the nature of the Philistine people to be grievers, to weaken everyone around them and wear you down. Now, there's a side road here, and I'm going to take it. Some of you know some Philistines, even if you don't know them by that name. I'm going to preach before I get out of here. There are people in your life who have the uncanny ability to be able to pull the strength out of your life and not in a good way. They have the ability. There are people in your life who after you spend time with them, you personally feel energized. There are people like that in the realm of your life that after you spend a little while with them, you're like, man, I feel better. I'm so glad we had some time together. But then there are other people who after you have spent time in their presence, you don't feel energized. 
You feel as though something has sucked the energy and the life right out of you. They are those people. They are the Philistine people. They, listen, they have a problem for every solution. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm probably talking about you. They sing that old hee-haw song, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. So as he is on the run, listen, living in a land that is meant to wear you down, the Philistine land, he comes into favor with their king, King Achish, whose name literally means you cannot make this stuff up. His name literally means it is what it is. Who hates their child that much? <laughs> hey, we've had a son. It is what it is, whatever. They, that's going to be important. I'm coming back to that. At some point in their relationship, in a very short period of time, he comes into such favor with this king that King Achish gives David a city, an entire city. The city's name was Ziklag, which is not just a city but it's a place of revelation because the name Ziklag comes from the root of a Hebrew word, which means to press someone or something to reveal what is inside. It's going to be good before we leave. I want you, if you will, right there, I know you just came for church on Sunday morning, but start praying for revelation right there where you are. I don't know what kind of hell you've been through this week, but just pray that the cobwebs have fade out and you'll, you'll start hearing what God is saying in here this morning. Pray for revelation. The more you grow in your faith, you'll start to understand this, that problems are never just problems. Right. That trials are never just trials. That whatever battle it is that I am facing right now is not just about this, but there's a whole lot of something else that is going on that I may or may not be able to understand or see. But every battle I have ever fought has brought me here. And every battle that I'm going to face in my future is going to have something to do with this battle that I'm fighting right now. That's why this battle is as important as it is. You learn this. That Listen to this. Hard days in your life are never just meaningless. Never. Oh, I'm having a hard day. Oh, there's a reason. Enemies in your life are never just enemies. Oh, that's just, no, 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 no. Enemies are never just enemies. Opposition is never incidental. It is purposeful. Every circumstance that you face is, is rarely ever what it appears to be, but is a part, I'm going to preach, is a much bigger process. It doesn't matter if the devil brings it or you bring it yourself. Troubles are the tools in a much larger story than the one that is actually happening. It, it took me a long time. You're going to get all of this at one time. It took me a long time to learn this, but Ziklag represents those places and those times in our life when we make the mistake, listen, of running from God to someone or something else besides God. That's what Ziklag represents. When we make the mistake of running from God and we run right out to something else besides him, the result of which always ah, puts you in a place that is going to grieve, weaken, or wear you down. When I was in church, my life was a certain way. But when I got out of that and I started living in the world, I noticed that it was not as easy as it used to be. Duh. That's why, because you went to that place that was meant to weaken and wear you down. And yet, here's the goodness of God. While we are in that place where we went to because we wanted to be there, God is going to use all of that to reveal what is really on the inside of us. And as he reveals what is on the inside of you, it's going to take you to a different place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Work with me, brother. Mm-hmm. In this moment, that is exactly where David is. Saul has tried 21 times to kill him, throwing a spear at him, after time after time, 21 times, and so David finally runs. How many of y'all would have probably ran after about number three? <laughs> Some fool throws a javelin at you, the third thing, that ain't a mistake, I'm out of here. David hangs out for 21 attempts on his life, and he runs, but yet without consulting God, he runs straight to the camp of his enemies. Goliath was a Philistine. 
His revelation never gets surprised. Mm, never get surprised when people under pressure, including yourself, do things that make no sense. Never get surprised when people under pressure do things that make no sense or do things that you said you'd never do. Mm, have you ever been under so much pressure that you did something foolish and then caught yourself and said, I said I'd never do that? You're, you're not wrong. Peter said, I will never deny you, Jesus. I will never deny you. They'll all deny you. I will not. Jesus said, you're right. You won't. You'll do it three times. You'll do it three times as much as everybody else. Judgmental people. Listen to this. Be careful when someone falls and you say, well, I'd never do that. That stings a little bit, doesn't it? Because we've been on the telephone talking about it. Oh, did you know that? Well, I'm glad I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. All of that is true because pressure has a peculiar effect. David immerses himself in the culture of the Philistines. Remember, a place that is meant to grieve, weaken, and wear down. David gains the favor of an ungodly king whose name means it is what it is. Who gives him his own city which it means a place of pressure that will reveal what is inside of you. Man, I see God setting him up. The enemies of David welcomed him in one day and then rejected him another day. I don't know if I should go into that, but okay. I will. <laughs> this one's trying to tell me I need to preach longer. I could, do, I could preach for three days if I needed to. I just, I keep it short for y'all. I keep it short for y'all. David was accepted by the king, but he was rejected by the princes. Hmm, what a modern day allegory. It's almost as if Achish was the king, but somebody else was running the country. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I try to stay away from that. But I'm not wrong. And Mr. Potato Head ain't running nothing. No, that's somebody else. Anyway, that's going to get me in trouble. Excellent. Okay, back to the word. Back to the word. Because that's, I don't want to make anybody mad. Unless I need to. So, so, so the king accepts him, but the princes reject him. Acceptance and rejection is a, is a peculiar thing. We live so much of our lives craving the acceptance of others. You can say, oh, I don't care, but you do. We, we live so much of our lives craving the acceptance of others only to find that when we get it, it doesn't mean as much as we thought that it was going to mean. Amen. It wasn't worth whatever it was that we had to give up to get that acceptance and rejection, we live so much of our lives trying to avoid rejection only to find out that sometimes the only way that I can get to the higher place that God wants me to be is when someone has dismissed me out of their lives. That's the only way that I can get to where I really need to be. Sometimes when people dismiss you out of their lives, your best response should be, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You finally got me out of here. Now I'm not connected to you anymore. So I can enjoy whatever blessing comes into my life from not being around a knucklehead, philistine, griever, weakener like you. Mm, tweet that. Chapter 30 is the story of when he is returning home to his home in, Z in Ziklag. After he has been rejected by the Philistine princes, and when he gets there, you read the story, he and his men find the place burned to the ground. Their city, their homes are burned to the ground. And all of their people are gone. Everyone. Their sons, their daughters, their wives, their mothers. Which represents everything about you. Your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your mothers represents your past, your present, your future, your identity, your help, and your community. And so this was not an accidental, incidental thing. They were, they were stripped of their identity. They were stripped of their past. They were stripped of their present. And they were stripped of their future. That's why the devil is always after your family. 
He's always after your family, trying to strip you of your future. In that moment, in this place appropriately named Ziklag, a place where pressure reveals, that very thing begins to manifest. In this moment, that very thing starts to happen. David's men, David's men who had run to him and put their lives in his hands. Everyone who was in debt, distressed, and discontented, they were thieves, they were liars, they were outcasts, they were down and out, and they were rejected by everyone in the world. But when they ran to David, they were accepted by him. David accepted them, and under his leadership, they became more than they ever dreamed possible for their lives. To this day, we know them as David's mighty men. We don't know them as thieves and liars and cutthroats. We know them as David's mighty men. But listen, watch this. See this unfold in front of your eyes. Suddenly, under pressure, his friends become his enemies. He's led them. He has fed them. He has served with them. He has loved them. He has protected them. He has fought with them. And now, in their darkest moment, verse 6, his people are talking about stoning him. Ziklag is living up to his name, a place that will press in on you and reveal what is really inside of you. Pressure has power. And if you don't know that, you have not lived long enough. Where's all the older people at who know what I'm talking about right now? Pressure has an amazing power in your life. As a matter of fact, if, if you've never been around someone who is under pressure, you still don't know who they are. I'll wait. Because you know I'm telling you the truth. Because you've been around somebody that you thought you knew. And when they got under pressure, you were like, oh, Jesus. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you? Where'd you come from? They're a mixture of Ted Bundy and... <laughs> you're, like, you're afraid for your own life. Like, just a minute ago, they were casual and cool. Now I'm afraid they're going to kill me and eat me. Pressure. Your closest friends... I'm going to say it. Your closest friends need to have been proven in the furnace of affliction. You don't need to let everybody in close to you in your life. Your closest friends are the ones who have been proven to you in the furnace of affliction. They are the ones who have been under pressure and you've been there to watch it. I've got some and I'm thankful for it. Your closest friends need to have been proven in the furnace of affliction. In Gethsemane, we see who Jesus is. As he cries out to his Father God for deliverance, we also see who the disciples were as they all run to get away from him. Pressure. How often does it happen when you find yourself under pressure and you immediately do something or you say something before you caught yourself and immediately after that you say, oh, I don't know where that came from. I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. And I know where it came from. It came from deep down on the inside of you. Be and the pressure, whatever it was that was happening in that moment, just squeezed it out. Right, Y'all right. ain't saying nothing now. Y'all all went <laughs> suddenly got holy on me. It would be so easy to read this story and talk about it from a sanitized or historical viewpoint. But one of the main points of this story is that pressure has a way of showing you what is really inside of you. That's right. Under pressure. Mm -hmm. Under pressure. Mm -hmm. Under pressure, David's men instantly consider killing him. We don't know what else to do. Let's kill him. That's literally the story. Oh, he's the king. He's led us. He's fed us. He's loved us. He's served with us. He's prayed for us. He's taken care of us. He has literally provided everything for us. All right, let's kill him. That'd be like y'all coming to church every Sunday saying, man, my pastor is just so such a nice preacher. He's awesome. One day I step on your personal sin and you say, we got to kill him. <laughs> Judgmental hypocrite. But watch this, under that same set of circumstances, the exact same pressure, David has a different response. Did y'all see it? I get ready to shout. Verse 6 says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. So see, the men, when they came under pressure, their first response was, we're going to have to kill him. But when David came under that exact same pressure, he lost just as much as they did. Maybe even more than they did because now he's lost the support of his mighty men David encouraged himself in the Lord. I came this morning just to quickly remind you that life will press you. Life, I said, will press you. We live in a world that is custom designed to squeeze you and press you and stress you out. And when it does, whatever is in you 
is what's going to come flooding out of you. David's men were pressed, and immediately they became murderous. But in that same moment, the Bible says that David encouraged himself. And as good as that is, it gets better because that moment became one of the greatest turning points in his life. Pressure will press you until you are sure about something. David calls the priest of God to come. Y'all remember? We read it. David calls the priest of God to come. Because when he did it on his own the first time, he ended up in the land of the Philistines, a place that will grieve you, weaken you, and wear you out. So now he asks God what to do. See, pressure has caused him to recognize I can do life on my own, but it is so much better when I do it with God in charge. Y'all didn't say nothing. I can can do it by myself, but it is always going to be better when I let God take the driver's seat. Amen? From that point, from that point, from that moment, he decides to seek God. And he asks for a word from the Lord. From that moment on, God gives David victory after victory. David asks the question, shall I go after them? And God says, yes. And he goes and he recovers, according to the word of God, he recovers everything. And in his battles with them to recover everything, there is not a record of a single loss or a single failure or setback in that entire story. Submission to God brings victory into your life on an entirely different scale. Did y'all hear? Come on, y'all. Submission to God brings victory into your life on a scale that most of us have never yet begun to experience. We think if we win one or two little things, oh man, we're doing it and God's doing it with us. No, no, no. God wants to give you life on a level that you don't even understand just yet. He gave him victory after victory with no failures, no setbacks. By the end of the book, mm, by the end of the book, King Saul is dead. The man who had tried to kill him 21 times. David is heartbroken. Read it in your Bible. (laughs) Uh, Here's a glimpse into my life. Dude tries to kill me 21 times. They tell me he's dead. I'm having a party. (laughs) I'm going to pop a top on a couple ginger beers. Here we go. Good. (laughs) Now I can sleep at night. I don't have time to preach this, but, but don't rejoice when your enemies fall. Don't rejoice when your enemies fall because God has a strange way of he'll lift them right back up (laughs) so that you're standing there looking stupid. Don't rejoice when your enemies fall. 2 Samuel chapter 2. I'm reading the book now. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, David prays again. After this, and he says, okay, now Saul is dead. What do I do now, Lord? Something has shifted. Now, instead of doing it his own way and failing, David is now seeking God. I don't get it. When he he first ran from Saul, he didn't seek God. But now, before he makes any move at all, he prays. He calls and he asks, what should I do? This is a new man. This is a different man. This is a man who has been humbled and purified by fire. This is a man who knows the meaning of the phrase, you're going to learn today. Because he learned and he found out. He found out that when you do life your way, you get what you get. Oh, here's another way to put it. It is what it is. I said, when you do life your way, it is what it is. But now he's not doing it his way. Anybody in here with me? Now he turns to God and says, shall I go back? Do I go back to where I came from? And God says, yes. Tells him where to go. David obeys God and in no time, David is anointed as the next king of Israel. Somebody needs to hear this, not everybody, but we need to let God supernaturally position you next in your life so that you will be in the right place at the right time so God can do something in your life. Let God shift where you are. Ah, did y'all get that? You may not see it, but what pressure is doing is making you sure about something. 
Y'all may not recognize it yet, but but the pressure that you have been under in your past has made you sure of something. I'm sure I can't trust that one. Oh, I'm sure I can't go back there anymore. (laughs) Some of y'all, they got a picture of you all up on the wall. Don't let them in here. Right? The pressure has made you sure of something. Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we fail. Help me, Lord. Sometimes we make mistakes, and sometimes we make the intentional decision to forget God, go our own way, and do our own thing. And when we do, one thing is for sure. Trouble is coming. Y'all, anybody want to testify? Oh, I wouldn't have had that prison record today if I would have. Oh, I wouldn't have had that failed business if I, or that failed marriage. Or I, I wouldn't have. Maybe a gunshot. Maybe you got a bullet hole in you somewhere. I know who I pastor. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but even in those times, here, here, hang with me. I'm almost done. Just another couple hours. Even in those times, God is working to turn things in your favor. And so when you find yourself under pressure, even if you caused it yourself, I just gave somebody that get out a grief card. You need to use it. Even, I said, even if you caused it yourself, you shipwrecked your own ship. Who? careful, Philip. Let's get real. Is there anyone in here who has ever just run from God and found yourself in trouble? I'll wait. There should have been 400 hands in here. That... God knows those places will, be, will bring you trouble. He ain't happy when you run there. Because the way of the transgressor is hard. So, Father, it hurts me when I see saw my sons do stuff that hurt their lives. It hurt me deeply to watch it happen. Your Father knows that those places that you run to to get away from Him will cause you so much trouble. But yet, help me, Lord. The goodness of God. I said the goodness of God is still to be found in those places because Ziklag, that place where someone goes to do things their own way, will still accomplish the purpose of God in your life. Did y'all see that? It will still bring about God's purpose. So what you need, what that means to you parents is to pray for your prodigal children. Don't ever stop praying for your prodigal children because no matter where they run, God will meet them right there where they are. You raise them in church. You raise them right. Believe that as they are running from God and doing their own thing, that they will run to the place that God has for them. And when they get there, the pressure that is in that moment will squeeze in on their lives and they will find that seed of God still in their life. They'll find it still down inside of them. Thank God. Thank God for pressure. And thank God for the pressing places. Three of you got that. The rest of you are like, oh, I ain't saying nothing. (laughs) Sometimes it's Ziklag. And sometimes it's Gethsemane. But either way, when it's happening, Mm. when the pressure is on in your life, remember this, that it's not for the purpose of destroying you. Even if you caused it yourself. It's not for the purpose of destroying you. In fact, as you're walking with God, it's not going to destroy you, but it's going to prove you. And it's going to prove to you that your strength is not enough. You ain't that bad. You thought you were, but you're not. There wasn't anybody that was any badder than David was. And in that place of pressure, Ziklag proved him who he was. He had to encourage himself in God. It will prove to you that his ways are higher than yours. That pressure isn't going to squeeze something out of you. 
Don't let pressure have the wrong effect. You, you, you get under pressure and you let pressure squeeze the joy out of you and take it away. Squeeze the peace out of you and take it away. But let God change that so that when you get into a place of pressure and it starts squeezing in on you, you find out that the tighter it squeezes, you find that joy is still on the inside of you. That peace from God is still on the inside of you. It's still in there. That pressure happens to bring you to the end of yourself. And in every one of our lives, the end of yourself is the beginning of God. Oh, y'all, singers, y'all come join me in here. David went from exile to exaltation. See, some of the pressure that you're under right now, it's bringing you to exaltation. <laughs> Isn't that sometimes the last thing you want to hear? Oh, goody. Oh, good. Bring on more of it. The shepherd boy was finally the king of Israel. After all that, after all that, in a moment, I'm going I'm to I'm invite and pray for people under pressure. I felt it so strongly this whole week that our world right now is, is custom designed to squeeze and press. And all my I'm fine people, I'm fine, I'm fine. Maybe today's a good day for you to say, I'm not really, I'm not fine. I'm not fine. The pressure that I'm experiencing, some of you laid in bed last night and you thought you were having a heart attack. I might have been one of you. I lay in bed and I think about what we're doing right now and I wake up hyper like <sighs> so yeah you ever want to know what the preacher's dealing with in his life listen to his sermons right I'm preaching about pressure I'm feeling it but it's a good thing it's a good kind of pressure so God is doing something even in the room right now so with heads bowed hearts open we're just going to we're going to pray, and then in a moment, we're going to give invitations for prayer. And I want us to lay hands on people and pray and, and let God do something. We are that church. We are that church. Under pressure. Under pressure. Father, today, revelation has been given. Let that revelation accomplish your purpose. Not a cute sermon. Not meant to be that meant to be a revelation meant to be a revelation so let revelation accomplish your purpose pressure pressure maybe you're in this moment this morning you're on the run from God how ironic you know why you ran to church? Because there's still that little seed of God inside. It's still there. It's still there. And maybe you caused it yourself or maybe the devil has squeezed in on you and life is crushing down on side of you and the devil thinks, I got him, I got her, I'm showing him. But that little seed of God that is on the inside of you somehow pulled you, compelled you to be in the house of the Lord so that you could sit and hear this word. That that pressure is meant to show you. It's meant to press in on you and show you what's really on the inside of you. So the devil failed again. What's really on the inside of you is a hunger for God, a need for God, a search for God. So God, I need you, and I know you brought me here today, so I'm going to obey. Pressure. I won't run down the list, but let's talk about it. A few things. Business pressure. I don't know that I've ever seen a time in my life where the pressure is on business people like it is right now. Y'all drive by their buildings and they're not doing any maintenance and they're not painting the outsides and they're not cleaning it all up. You think it's because they're lazy. No, it's because they can't. They're just barely making enough to stay alive. And it's scary. Pressure. More money going out than coming in. Pressure families 
under pressure. Not sure what tomorrow is going to bring. Not sure what tonight's going to bring. It's just, we could go down that list, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, if there's anybody in the house this morning that you recognize in this moment as you sit here that this is a word from heaven into your life, in a moment, I'm going to give an invitation for you to come. And this is old-fashioned, but it is so good that you can cast your cares on Him, that you can lay something down at an old-fashioned altar this morning in prayer. I can bow my knee, I can kneel down and hand it to God one more time, casting my cares on Him because I know that He cares for us. I'm going to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us so that I can get up from that altar and I can run the race that God has set before me. Today is a turnaround day for me. Today is a day for something to happen and for a turnaround to happen in my life. God brought me here on purpose with a purpose. I'm not going to miss this. If you're here this morning and you came in here with some things pressurizing your life, physical, emotional, financial, when I give this invitation for prayer, come find a place to pray and just say, God, here I am. I just I want to lay this at your feet. I want to lay this at your feet because I can't do this anymore. I can't carry it myself. I can't do it myself. I'm tired. All my I'm fine people, this is your day. I'm fine. Lay it at his feet. And watch what God can do. This is a lifting moment. This is a lifting moment. Let the Lord lift that burden in here. You guys, if y'all will come, everyone in the building, if you wouldn't mind standing up on your feet this morning, and y'all know how this works, altar workers. I want y'all to anoint and pray for anybody that comes. It may be one, it may be two. But whomever comes to lay, to lay something down this morning, I pray that God will help you with that burden, and you'll lay it down. Anybody who is under any kind of a pressure, come on and find a place to pray. And let's just trust the Lord together this morning. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.